There are those who dream of a better world. Those who strive to climb higher, swim deeper, and venture further than the rest. We call them Da Vinci's. We marvel at their genius and are awed by their unbreakable spirit. Here they come. Stand back and watch as they inspire the human race by living a Da Vinci life. Hey guys, it's Rusty Johnson from A Da Vinci Life. You know, to be a Da Vinci, you need two things. Big brains and big balls. Today's guest, he's got both. He's a genius financial journalist during the day and a fearless adventurer by later that day. He scoured the globe up and down and climbed mountains in nearly every continent. And usually you can find him traveling as fast as a bullet or standing still getting shot in the stomach by one. So uh, hold on, it's going to be a wild ride. I give you Jimmy Clash. Rusty? Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Got a little bit of background here with the space thing, if that's okay. That, man, that looks fantastic. But yeah, Jim, thanks for uh, for coming on. And you know what? When I met you through the years through the Explorers Club, I've known you as the adventure columnist for Forbes magazine, as, do, as well as doing a lot of writing for uh, the Explorers Club. But then I learned that actually you started out as a business journalist. And yes, yes. So, so how did that begin, and when and how did the transition to venture come through? Well, you know, when I first started at Forbes, um, they hired me because I have an MBA from Columbia, mm -hmm. and thought I could write about the stock market and mutual funds and things like that. I started as a, um, a reporter, had to do fact-checking, and then write stories on the side. The more stories you can write, the faster you get promoted. Mm -hmm. So I went up the ranks to staff writer and then associate editor. And on the side, I had this mountain climbing hobby. And uh, I went out and I climbed Matterhorn. And, uh, and, and they said, well, why don't you write a story in the back of the book, which is we have something called personal affairs. In front of the book, you tell people how to make money. In the back of the mm -hmm. book, you tell them how to spend it. So <laughs> I, um, I wrote up this story on the Matterhorn and... Uh, and it went over really well. And some of the advertisers saw the trend, people mm -hmm. going more into buying adventure as opposed to another house in the Hamptons. Right. And they said, well, why don't, why don't we pitch a column to some of the advertisers called The Adventure? And that's what they did. And suddenly I couldn't just write about mountain climbing. I had to write about race car driving and South Pole, North Pole, all that, because you can't keep doing the same thing. So right. really I got this dream job going yeah. around the world and getting them to pay for it. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. So after the Matterhorn, what, what was the progression? What adventure did you do after that for Forbes? I'm pretty sure the second one was mountain climbing in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, Virgin Peaks. So we got to go out and climb these peaks that have never been climbed. And then from there, I'm trying to remember what the next one was. I think it was a polar thing or something mm -hmm. But yeah, and then eventually race cars, bobsledding, getting shot, bullfighting, all those Hemingway kind of things, right? It's something like, you know, there are only three sports in the world, bullfighting, mountain climbing, and auto racing, the rest are games. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and what I like about that quote, and by the way, he's been on, on um, PBS recently for the, the Ken Burns documentary, but what he meant, I think, is that when you got risk, risk involved, real risk, mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to if you're golfing, what happens if you land in a sand trap? No right. big deal. But if you're, you know, you screw up in a corner on a race car, you're going to pay the consequences. So I think Hemingway was saying, look, if, if, if there's some real risk involved, that makes this, the thing more, um, I don't know what the right word is, more consequential. Mm -hmm. This list, I saw you write down online and <laughs> this isn't the, the, the list of what you've done. It was just kind of your favorite things. And I wrote it down. It, it's so long, but I'll just kind of just skim through it. Like driving a Bugatti at 253 miles an hour, flying a MiG-25 at 84,000 feet at Mach 2.6. What was that like? And, and that's where you were able to see outer space, correct? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see outer space, but I did see the edge of space. And yes. that, that, that was a trip in, I believe it was 99. And space adventures had just come into being. At that point, they, they were using Russian 
aircraft to take people on these joy rides. That was mm-hmm. before they were sending uh, Dennis Tito and, and Greg Olson and those guys to, to space, Richard Garriott. And mm-hmm. so they invited me over to Russia to do this flight. And I had no idea what I was getting into. I just knew mm-hmm. that, you know, I love space. And you know, as a kid, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, interviewed those mm-hmm. guys. So I went to Zhukovsky Air Base, which used to be a very, very secretive base in Russia. And what was happening is Russia had collapsed. So the military people were not getting paid. Mm -hmm. So what Space Adventures were able to do was sort of be the middleman between hiring their Air Force people in in their planes and then Mm -hmm. renting, selling the the rides to rich people in America. So anyway, I went out there. um, They spent a morning, you know, sort of training me on the ejection seat. I remember I got in the plane. The pilot says, uh, Alex Garnier, he goes, Jim, if I give command, eject, 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 this is not command for discussion, only for fulfillment. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. And, yeah. uh, and he says, and he showed me the handles I had to pull. But then he pointed to this red handle and he said, but do not touch this handle. And I said, why not? He goes, you could eject me. I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> 84,000 feet. I eject him. What am I going to do? Anyway, we went up. Um, we, we broke the sound barrier the first time at about 30,000 feet. We kept climbing, went Mach 2. Uh, maybe we were about 45,000. And then we really started to climb and accelerate. And uh, as I did that, the, the sky got darker and darker. When we got up to Mach 2.6, we were top speed climbing very rapidly. And then as we approached our apogee, we started to slow down, mm-hmm. but the sky got black and I could wow. see the curvature of the earth. I could see uh, the blackness of space and I could see the little thin atmosphere hanging over the earth. You realize mm-hmm. how thin it is when you're up there. Uh, and then all of a sudden we went into this screaming dive because there wasn't enough air to keep the plane afloat. Mm-hmm. And we went down fairly quickly. The whole flight took maybe 35 minutes We Mm -hmm. burned like 5,000 gallons of kerosene or something. And um, I was back on the ground. And it was like a life, almost a life-changing experience to see Earth like that. I can imagine. What toll does it take on the physical body when you're hitting those Gs at at that speed? Well, I mean, G is really a a, a factor of of acceleration, cornering and all that. We were pretty smooth about our acceleration so i didn't feel a lot of g's maybe a couple of g's we did some rolls did some other things but it wasn't an aerobatics flight it was more Mm -hmm. of a high altitude flight i've done aerobatics where you know you're pulling five six g's being thrown around uh that's much more uncomfortable Um, yeah do you black out or or have you trained at all to do that or you just went and did it I've trained in a centrifuge, but that was mm. later. Um, and, you know, pulled six Gs, sustained Gs, uh, G, they call it GX through your chest. And then you pull like five through your head, which is called GZ, which is much more uh, disconcerting. Mm. But but in, in these aerobatic planes, you, you just go from zero Gs to six Gs and back to three Gs. And, you know, so it's very disorienting and you get sick. Um, yeah. I've, I've been sick in these planes. Mm-hmm. Um but the MiG flight was, was fairly stable when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. What I learned later, though, about the MiG flight, I was out at, at um, Beale Air Force Base with the U-2 pilots. And they all wear a spacesuit when they go up above 70,000 feet. And I was like, why do you wear a spacesuit? You're in a, you know, a, a compressed um, cockpit. You've got mm-hmm. oxygen. Well, if something happened and we lost compression, you decompressed, you die in like two seconds. Ooh. And I said, well... They said, what did you have on in the MiG? And I said, well, I just had like an oxygen mask and a a pressure suit. And they said, you're crazy. He said, anything would have happened. You were dead. And I didn't know it at the time. So anyway, so the Russians do things a little differently than we do. Yeah, they definitely seem to be more cowboys when it comes to aeronautics and space. Yeah, and I don't think that, you know, human life isn't that as important to them as it is to us. How many different times have you traveled in and say... F-14s or, or MiGs and jets? Well, I've been supersonic four, four separate times um, mm-hmm. in, a, in the old Concorde, uh, in an F-15, um, in a MiG-25 uh, MiG Foxbat, which is talked about, and then uh, in the English Electric Lightning, um, which is a whole other story in itself. It's a pretty dramatic story. But And then I've flown in um, P-51 Mustang, um, uh, T-38, Mm-hmm. Uh, a plane that the astronauts used to train in for the shuttle. 
I've flown, I, I actually piloted the B-52 once um, wow. for a minute. Uh, but I've been in C-130s. I flew through Hurricane Dorian. Yeah, what was that like? I saw a video clip from that. It seemed amazing. Yeah, well, you know, we, we, we crisscrossed that hurricane four times. When we went into it, it was Category 4. When we came out, it was a Category 5. And it's not just for thrills. They take these planes in. We drop radio signs out the back, which measure barometric pressure, wind speed, humidity, temperature. And what they do is they try to use those um, to predict where the hurricane's going to go. Mm -hmm. So we were in that plane for 12 hours straight, flew through the hurricane four times. When you fly through the eye wall, which is the sort of circular thing around the eye, that's mm -hmm. the most violent time. And, and you know, the... <laughs> I thought the wings were going to fall off that plane. Really? Uh, 130. But then you get into the eye and it's perfectly calm. And wow. at night we could see stars above us and we could see all right. the lights in the Bahamas below. And of course those lights, the Bahamas got pretty savaged by that hurricane. So yeah, that yeah, was a great trip. I didn't realize that you could do that until I was invited by the air force. I've done a number of air force stories, U S air force stories, which have been pretty cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Been up to Thule, in Greenland, watch the missile surveillance people up there. I've been down at the bottom of the missile silos in, in Rhinot, North Dakota, where the guys have the two keys to turn to send the missiles really? to Russia. And they were live while I was down there. Um, man, they took everything away from us, tape recorder, uh, cell phone, watch, everything. And uh, they escorted us down 60 feet in an elevator with three guards with machine guns. Wow. At the bottom, there was a giant 12-ton vault door that they had to open, and another vault door. So it's, you know, pretty secure. Right. But wow. And uh, and I remember interviewing one of these guys there in their 20s. And I said, well, if you got the command from the president to launch the missiles, would you? And they went, absolutely. There's no politics down here. Yeah. And kind of hair on the back of my neck stood up because they had enough pot firepower there to probably annihilate five or six big cities in Russia. I had my first taste of those. I mean, obviously from a distance, I was out in Montana on a falconry trip, flying my Falcons and the people yeah. who own the, pro yep. people who own the property, they told me, well, there's, there's missile silos here and they're over here. They said, don't stop near it. Don't take pictures. Just keep on going. Uh, sure. Otherwise you're going to get in, in some trouble. It's, it's true. Um, there's Montana, there's Minot, North Dakota, and I think there's some down in the uh, Arkansas area or something, but there are three major areas where they have these missiles. And I couldn't believe I got to do the story, but I did. Yeah. did. And uh, as, as part, I also went, I saw a, a, a rocket launch at Cape Canaveral of an Air Force satellite on a, uh, a medium. It was a, I can't remember the name of the rocket, but it was a, a pretty heavy duty rocket. Mm -hmm. uh, I've flown the F-15 out of um, Seymour Johnson at uh, Mach 1.2. I was a passenger. So, I, again, I've done a lot of Air Force stories, and uh, it's been fascinating. Wow. I did an Army story, too. I, I embedded with the Fort Bragg guys and jumped off the parachute tower and uh, got to hang a, a mortar and some other crazy things. But <laughs> Very yeah. cool. With the electric lightning, was that the one I, we previously talked and you said it was a, a tragedy involved with that? Was that the jet? Yeah, well, the electric lightning, there was a, a place called Thunder City out of Cape Town. And what they did was they would thrill tourists with a lot of money um, with these old aircraft like English Electric Lightning, the Buccaneer. Uh, and, and they had a, I think it was a fleet of about 15 old military British aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, elect, the electric lightning that I was to fly in was basically to go supersonic. Mm -hmm. And um, the plane and the pilot had both been with Richard Branson on record setting climbs to 50, 60,000 feet. So the pilot was probably the best pilot in South Africa. The plane was supposed to be one of the, the great old fighter jets equivalent to like the 15 F-15 or something in America. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, uh, I mean, I spent the whole morning with him going over the ejection seat. And I remember him saying to me, you're safer in this than you are in a 737 because if something happens, you've got a parachute. It's, it's basically on your ejection seat. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we, we took off. We flew supersonic over to Bredesport where the air show was the next day. And I thought that was it. The flight was over. We started to come down to the runway. And then all of a sudden he pulled the plane straight up and we went into eight minutes of the most horrific aerobatics I have ever experienced. I was puking all over the place. 
um, you know, my, my head would be thrown back at five G's and you know, this way and that way. And I mean, I couldn't believe the stuff he did with that aircraft. And finally we landed and I was kind of pissed off. Like, mm -hmm. why did you do that to me? You know, and he said, well, I had to validate my flight plan for the air show tomorrow. So you just happen to be along for the ride. <laughs> and I remember he said to me, kind of laughed and he goes, in a couple of days, when you feel better, you're going to see this as a life changing experience. And I thought, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you going to stick around for the air show tomorrow? And I said, no, I've got to I got to go back to Cape Town, do this 367 foot rappel off of Table Mountain, mm -hmm. which is the longest, highest rappel in the world. So I went back and um, after that, I, I picked up a copy of the Cape Town Times and the, there was a front page story about a, a crash at the air show. And evidently that was the fighter jet had gotten into trouble, hydraulics and the pilot was able to steer the plane away from the crowd, dump his fuel and the last words were ejection seat failure. And then I read it was Dave Stock, my pilot and it was the English electric lightning I had been in 18 hours before. So for me, it was like a punch in the stomach. Yeah. Um, I immediately thought about everything. And uh, I thought about would my ejection seat have worked if we would have gotten into trouble the day before. And, um, and I think what it shows is you can spend a lot of money on an adventure. I think it's a $15,000 flight, but it doesn't mean it's safe. Right. You know, there's real risk, like Hemingway said, you know. Yeah. So, but that made me think about what I do for a living, and mm -hmm. I'm more careful about how I evaluate the risk-return ratios. Yeah. Now, that sure. was like 11 years ago. Yeah. So now, yeah, uh, so I've done a lot of, you know, a, a lot of exotic aircraft, um, and ultimately, I do want to fly in space at some point. So. Yeah, you have a seat on Virgin Galactic, right? Yeah. Whenever that happens, I bought the and, ticket and he, 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, every how, year, every year, <laughs> it's next year, whatever. How many sky miles would that set you back, man? <laughs> That's well, a lot of air I, points there. Yeah, I don't think that would be probably uh, millions and millions. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but no, I mean, you know, I, I applaud Richard Branson and his efforts to do it. You know, he's competing with Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos, and not really with SpaceX. I mean, that's a whole other deal with Orbital and transporting yeah. stuff to the space station. The Virgin Galactic flight is a suborbital flight. So you go into space and then come back down and you're only in space five minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Space is considered 100 kilometers up or 62 miles. So mm -hmm. you are over, you know, the view I had in the MiG would be four times as high from Virgin Galactic. So I'm sure that's really life changing. You've been on to the North Pole as well as the South Pole and you skied in one yeah, and swam in another. Yeah, the, well, the, I've been to North Pole twice. The first time mm -hmm. I went up with Russians through Hatanga in Siberia and then up to Shredny Island, then to um, Barneo, which is the, the station 60 miles um, on the ice cap. And then we flew an MI-8 helicopter to the South Pole or North Pole, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. The second time I went up to the North Pole, I went up on an icebreaker called the mm -hmm. Yamal. And it took us about eight days of breaking through ice to get to the, to the geographic North Pole. And I felt kind of guilty because <laughs> you think about Perry and Cook and those guys and yeah. frostbite and everything they suffered. And I thought, I got to do something. Yeah. So we, we did the polar plunge. And we, How'd that we, feel? Uh, it was cold. It was, uh, it was that old Seinfeld shrinkage episode. <laughs> um, it was, yeah, it was cold. What they did is they put a tether around our waist mm -hmm. and we dove off the ice because um, it, the icebreaker had cut a hole in the ice. Actually, the North Pole is nothing more than an ice cap floating on mm -hmm. water. South Pole is an ice cap on land. It doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And um, so I dove in and they had, when we came out, they had a, a paddles, like the doctors had paddles in case we had a heart attack. Really? And they gave us a chocolate and a shot of vodka. And I remember standing in my bathing suit, totally wet. And the air temperature was maybe five degrees, but it felt like it was 85 degrees out. And I was standing there because the water had been so cold. Um, and everyone said, you better go back to the ship and, you know, put your clothes on because you're going to get sick. And I was like, ah, come on, it's, it's summer, but it's just an illusion. So, right. Yeah. But that was in the South Pole is a whole different deal. Um, I went down to the South Pole in 2005, skied the last degree. So it was 10 miles of skiing a day, um, cold as hell, 30 below zero. Mm -hmm. face masks, all that stuff, or you get frostbite. 
Then we'd have to pitch our tents on the ice. Um, the South Pole is a 9,000 foot of altitude over land. It's ice cap of 9,000 feet. So, wow. so by the time we got to the South Pole, and there's a station there, it doesn't move, uh, except that maybe 20 feet a year, the ice moves over. So they have to change the pole marker every year by about 20 feet. But mm -hmm. there's a whole little city down there called the Amundsen Scott Station. And there's a lot of wackos down there, especially the ones who stay over winter. They only mm -hmm. allow maybe 30 or 40 of them to stay. During the summer, maybe 250 people. You know, they operate the, the, the generators and the power and the summer in the cafeterias, cooks, and then there's people who are scientists who do the telescopes. And so it's, it's like a little city. I have a friend of mine who actually from my town, who I guess is in charge of uh, waste removal down there. I haven't seen him in like yeah, 10 years. I think he's still there. And he was a strange cat too. Let's, <laughs> well, and honestly, they do go through some sort of psychological evaluation to stay on the pole um, for for winter because you cannot get into or out of the pole um, during the winter. You have to, uh, I mean, the planes can't land because the, 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 the wings will break off. They're too brittle and landing gear. So they're stuck there for like six or seven months. Mm -hmm. Some of them go crazy. There's been murders, things like that down there. Mm -hmm. So they psychologically test you before they do it. But I was only there for three days. What was the most impactful for you, North Pole or the South Pole? Oh, I'd always wanted to go to the South Pole more than the North Pole. And, yeah. and that was based on a ham radio contact I had had as a kid. I had a ham radio license when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a guy on the South Pole and I thought, man, what's it like down there? I want to go down there. So yeah. it took me, you know, 40 years to do it, but I did it. So, yeah, I, th I think the South Pole, too, because of the altitude, it's a lot colder um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just more interesting to me. It was a lot harder to get there skiing down there. So mm -hmm. I felt like we had kind of earned it. I know some of the activities that you actually got hurt at, one would be pretty obvious. And it, it, it flabbergasted me when I found out that you were going to do it and then you did it was get shot uh, while wearing a uh, bulletproof vest. Now, was that done in Columbia because it would be illegal here in the United States? Yeah, what happened was I was watching the military channel one night and I saw this guy named Miguel Caballero on who made these fashion bulletproof jackets and things. And he would shoot his employees as a stunt to make them understand how important the work they were doing was because they're basically saving their own lives. Yeah. So I called him and I said, Hey, will you, can you shoot me and come to New York? And he goes, no, no, we can't do it in New York. You have to come down to Bogota. So I went down to Bogota, Colombia. And um, I remember he showed us all the labs where they fire the guns. And the reality is with this, with this particular gun, you cannot use a rifle because the bullets are too fast, but yeah. a handgun will stop. So mm -hmm. he asked me what handgun I wanted. Give me a 38 long or a Glock or whatever. I picked the 38 long. Mm -hmm. And um, then I found out that normally when he shoots somebody, he puts a layer of Kevlar right in the area. So kind of cheating really as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. No, no, I want I want you to shoot me without the Kevlar. He's like, <laughs> I don't know. Crazy. He said that that's going to really hurt. He said, plus you probably break a rib or a hip if I don't hit you in the middle between the two. And I said, well, that's the story. Mm -hmm. So he shot me, and it hurt. The thing I remember though is that we practiced many times before the shot. He said, okay, put your hands behind your back, and then go ready and tense up, and goes hold your breath and goes one, two, and then shoots you on three. And we did that maybe five times. And you keep your hands behind your back because he doesn't want you to move and then maybe put your hand in front of the bullet or something. Mm -hmm. And so when he actually did it, he shot me on one. And I was <laughs> really surprised. And I thought, I thought, oh my God, you know, he, the gun went off, he's going to shoot me again. But then he, he lowered the gun and laughed. And he said, I did that out of surprise. He didn't get a chance to think about it. Did it feel like you suspect it or was it a totally different experience than you thought it would be? Or? It was different. It was, if I had to describe it, it would be kind of like a, I've never been hit by a bullwhip, but mm -hmm. you know, when that bullwhip hits you with this exactly at the tip of the thing, it burns. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I think it burned like crazy. And then there was like a thud, like Mike Tyson punch or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was oh. over and yeah. What was the aftermath like? Well, like it was funny. 
Well, there's a bruise, but it's funny because there was a whole, everybody in the factory, he shoots you on the factory floor and everybody on the factory sort of clapped afterwards. But beforehand, they were making the sign of the cross and rosaries <laughs> and all this stuff. And, and, then, and then afterward, he unzipped the jacket and, and you could see I already had a big welt starting to form. And then it got bigger. And I'd say I had a pretty bad bruise for about six weeks. Wow. But, but really no damage that I know mm -hmm. of. Um, I've been hurt, obviously, worse than other things, but, mm -hmm. but that's pretty, that was pretty dramatic. Bullfighting, that must have been dramatic. Yeah, bullfighting was just stupid. Um, <laughs> I had a, a PR woman who used to work with IndyCar, and she, she went over to the PBR, Professional Bull Riders. It's a company that puts on these events around the country. The bull riders come in, they put dirt. Madison Square Garden sells out. Mm -hmm. They bring in yeah. the bulls, the dirt cowboys everything and she said look you know we have these guys they're they're called bullfighters they're really rodeo clowns but when the rider is thrown off a bull you know he needs somebody to protect him from the bull you know charging because he's a helpless on the ground mm -hmm. so we have these guys who distract the bull would you like to try that and i said sure why not <laughs> so hey, his last words uh, yeah hold my yeah. beer yeah. And so I went to Texas and uh, they gave me a morning of sort of prep where mm -hmm. I, I had a little unicycle. And so what the, the key is, is to try to make the bull go in a circle around you so that it can't get you. And so I practiced this. And anyway, uh, afternoon we went out and there were three of us. There was Shorty Gorham and Frank Newsom and myself. And the other two guys were professionals with the PBR. So they do this every Sunday every you know they know what they're doing I don't mm -hmm. and the first bull came out and threw the rider like in five seconds and then we had to get him back in the chute because the rider was on the ground and uh I I remember I I got close to him and he his horns kind of went grazed my back and we got him in the chute and I went to the photographer and I said did, did you get that and he goes yeah I got it and I said good I think we're done and these guys said no 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 no, no, the New York kid's got to get some dirt on his face. <laughs> so we're going to send out another bull who's a little younger, a little meaner, not as big. I think the second one weighed about 2,000 pounds. His name was Horny Toad. And um, they said, be a little more aggressive with him. And so he came out through the rider in like three seconds. And then he was looking for something. And I locked eyes with him. And immediately he came after me, he charged me. And I tried to get around him to do that maneuver. And mm -hmm. the right horn caught the left side of my back. And he threw me five or six feet in the air with that torque and it broke three ribs. Oh. And then I slammed up against the fence. And, uh, and I was sitting there dazed. And um, mm -hmm. those other two guys got him away from me. And then, you know, thank God, because the bull could have killed me. And, mm -hmm. and then I was sitting in the ring watching him and he said, get the hell up. <laughs> yeah, He's going to come after you again. <laughs> so I got up and oh, I love it that I actually picked up my hat and ran out of the ring. I had the wherewithal to pick up my hat. And, and I have that hat autograph now from the two guys who saved my life. But uh, that was crazy. You, you, you know, you don't know what a wild animal is going to do. No. It's a lot more dangerous than running with the bulls. What I did. Um, so sure. I don't, I don't think I'm going to run with the bulls. I've had I've had enough bull for yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah, it's probably getting like freight lined by a Mack truck. Yeah, I mean, but the reality is, those guys they can step on your head. I mean, yeah, anything. You don't know what a wild animal is going to do, and that I learned. So mm -hmm. stay away from wild mm -hmm. animals. You've done some diving and submersible as well, right? Yeah, I did. I went down with um, Pat Leahy, who designed actually Victor Vescovo's um, submersible. He just went down to the bottom of Mariana Trench. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had a, uh, designed a number of, they're called Triton submersibles. Right. And, yeah, and we were off the coast of Bermuda, actually in the Bermuda Triangle, which made me a little nervous. Sure. But we took this thing down 1,000 feet and... Uh, the, the reason for the trip was they were trying to see how global warming had changed um, the, the temperature of the water in different layers down and how that changed the, the, live, the vegetation or the living things if they had to go down further for the colder water and things like that. Mm -hmm. But down there, it's pitch black. 
Um, we had lights on the submersible and we saw a lot of weird stuff down there, especially the wire coral. It looks like springs or something coming out of the, uh, the ground. But I remember just my biggest fear was having to go to the bathroom because we were down there for four hours and, uh, you know, uh, I'm right next to this guy and it's like, you know, there's no room for anything. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but yeah, so we, so we, it was fun. It was good. Uh, and I actually got some samples of things they let me keep from a thousand feet down. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I got some pictures that look like, like there was another submersible down there with us and with the lights and everything, they look like UFOs. Down there. Oh, I can so, imagine. Yeah. But it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. We spoke yesterday. Something that really surprised me was that you said one of the most kind of violent experiences that you've had was bobsledding. It was other than that damn English, English electric lightning, um, which was basically a bobsled in, in, in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, bobsledding is a lot more physical than people know from watching mm -hmm. it on TV, almost like race car driving. It looks so easy and you don't feel the G's and all that. But yeah, I went down the, the, from the top of the hill at Lake Placid with the Olympic mm -hmm. team. It was a two-man bobsled, so I had to do the brake. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember him saying, don't pull the brake until we're at the bottom and you'll, you'll kill us. We'll flip the sled. So no matter how scared I got, I, I wasn't to touch the brake until the end of the run. And right. I remember we, we pushed the sled running, as you see, and then we jumped in and there's nothing. There's no seats in there. There's, it's just a fiberglass shell mm -hmm. and these handles you hold on to. And within the first curve, I wanted to get out of there. It was just, you know, even the first curve was like three or four G's. And then you go right, left, up on the, I mean, we did 20 turns in less than a minute at 80 some miles an hour with no slowing down or just speeding up as you go down. Wow. And I remember when I got out, because it had taken me three years to arrange that. I had to join the U.S. Bobsled and Skeleton Federation. I had to get a physical with EKG. I had to sign like a million release forms. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, they said they'd never let a journalist do that before. And um, so when I got out, I remember he said, oh, so what'd you think of that, Mr. Forbes Adventure? And I said, hey, <laughs> you're nuts. You guys are crazy. And he said, well, you know, you're going to do it again. Right. I'm like, I don't think so. And he said, well, look, we had Laird Hamilton here, the big wave surfer. And he wanted to be a professional pusher, which is basically what I was doing. The, the break mm -hmm. guy in the back, he went down exactly like you did. He just said, that's it. I'm walking. He walked away. He wouldn't go down a second time. And wow. then they had um, Chris Chelios, who was a captain of the Detroit Red Wings, who also wanted to be tried out for the Olympic team doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't go down a second time. So I said, okay, I, I got to go down. So I went down a second time and uh, it was just as bad, if not worse mm -hmm. than the first time. And when I got done, I, I couldn't walk straight for a week. My equilibrium no. was screwed up. But the funniest thing is my guy, uh, John, something neighbor, I think it was something neighbor was the Olympian. And he, he was like, he couldn't even drink. We wanted to have like a um, beer afterwards and he had to have a milk. Wow. Because he wasn't even old enough to drink. And here this guy had my life in his hands. So, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. so but but I have to say, of all the things um, I've ever done, I think that's the most violent and probably mm -hmm. the most surprising in terms of violence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I got the impression that this was not an easy thing and it, it was physically demanding, but I, I never realized how demanding it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that if... Um, yeah, I don't know how many times a night they let those guys go down because it's just so you pull so many G's and you get um, dizzy and all that stuff. But but mm -hmm. I really have a lot of respect for the Olympic bobsledders. Yeah, and especially more now more respect for the Jamaican bobsled team. <laughs> yeah, right. That was a stretch. For <laughs> they, had, they, they had to do all that too, you know. So yeah, wow. that was a yeah. I would have to say, but the thing that you know, and a kind I did a. a my fair share of mountain climbing in the day, as I say, the Matterhorn, the Grand Teton, Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua, Mont Blanc. Um, you know, I, I did a, a number of amateur mountains, but um, the thing that gets me going the most now is the race car driving. Mm -hmm. I've always been a speed freak. And uh, as you say, I, I did I did drive the Bugatti at uh, 253 miles an hour, 407 kilometers an hour. And that was a pretty interesting experience because... I was on a straight 
straight away. So there was nothing involved other than keeping the car straight and hoping the wheel didn't, the tire didn't blow or animal mm-hmm. didn't run in front of me. But people say, what was it like? It was like being in a video game sped mm-hmm. up ridiculous. The car was mm-hmm. so stable, but everything was going by so fast. Wow. And I remember after, after I did it, I came in and then there were th- four other guys who were going to go out and do it. And they were all Bugatti owners who had paid 50 grand to do it. I was a journalist, so let me do it for free. Mm-hmm. And so when the guy came by, the second guy, I was standing there and watched it. That car, I would have never done it if I had known how fast that car was really going, watching mm-hmm. it from the ground. <laughs> I mean, we were doing a third of the speed of sound on the ground. Yeah. Um, but the thing that really, for me, as a race car, semi, whatever I am, um, mm-hmm. was driving the Indy car at 200 mile an hour average at Texas Motor Speedway. And that was, that was, that was hard a, to do. I mean, that was on average. Yeah. Man, that is yeah. fast. Well, it's a mile and a half oval. So mm-hmm. we're getting around in about 26 seconds each, each lap. And it had been a dream of mine since I had seen Tom Sneva in 1977 do the first 200 mile an hour lap at Indy. And it was kind of mm-hmm. like Roger Bannister's four minute mile. Nobody thought it would ever be possible. Right. So when he did it, I was watching, it was qualifying for Indy. And I said, God, what does that feel like? What's it like to be in a little go-kart basically doing that with no top and, you know, so 25 years later, I got to do it. And it took me a lot of planning. I had to raise money for charity. I had to talk IndyCar into letting me do it. And they tried to stop me from doing it because they thought it was too dangerous. Mm-hmm. And to this day, no journalist has ever done it since. And no journalist has ever done it before. It's just too dangerous. So that was my kind of piece of this. It was a piece of the resistance of my future career. What was it like? Because in an IndyCar, as you said, there's no top, so you're much right. more exposed. What was the sensation? Well, first of all, there's a lot of wind, and so you got to make sure your helmet is snug because I had tried one other time at Fontana, and my helmet was too loose, and it was pulling me up, and I couldn't mm. see the back. So I had to pull one hand on the steering wheel, one, and I ended up blowing the engine on that event. Um, I was lucky I didn't slide in my own oil. Um but yeah, so you got the wind, and then you got a lot of G-forces in the corners. You know, mm-hmm. we're pulling three and a half to four Gs in the corners because it's such a tight oval. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so you've got to, you start to gray out a little bit. You mm-hmm. got to keep your focus on the track. And then people think driving an oval is easy, but it's not. You've got to really hit your marks. You know, you, you come out toward the wall, then when you dive into the turn, you come in sharp because you want to minimize the, the size of the track you're going around, but keep your speed. So mm-hmm. when you come out, you come out to the wall, but you don't want to hit the wall. Mm-hmm. And when you're going in, you don't want to go under that yellow line because the difference between the banking in the corner and the flat part, if you get the one wheel, two wheels off, say on the banking, you're going to, you're going to spin. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I actually look at the video of that. Somebody videoed it. It was 2002 and, and, uh, I would I would never do that again. No, never. No, I was lucky, and that was before they had safer barrier walls, so the walls were concrete. Right. So Ooh, they hit yeah. the yeah, it would have been a bad, bad day. I remember, I was so committed to doing it. Um, to me, I was just going to do it. There was no, I didn't have any second thought about what would happen. Right. And now I look at the pictures of the people. Um, a lot of pictures were taken. There's a lot of fear in a lot of people's eyes. Not mm-hmm. mine, because I didn't know any better, but these guys knew what could happen. Yeah. And I think there was a 50-50 chance in their minds that I was either going to get killed or I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. So hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. You actually give a lot of rides now. Is that with NASCAR? Yeah. So so over the years, I've done a number of laps with this uh, two schools. One is called the NASCAR Racing Experience. Mm-hmm. And the other is called the Mario Andretti Racing School. And what they do is they're kind of like a skip barber, but they don't teach you the real intricacies of driving. They let you drive high speed and experience what it's like to be in a a NASCAR or an Indy car. And Mm -hmm. then they have this other program called Ride Arounds, where they have a pro take you around the track at some ridiculous speed. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago for a story, I said, hey, I've done enough stories as a, as a, a driver by myself 
would you let me take somebody around the track? Because then it's not just my life that's on the line, but somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, they said, sure. So I thought it was going to be a one-off. Um, and I went out and um, I did it in an Indy car and a stock car. And what track? I was at Fontana in California. And after that, they said, well, you know, you're good enough to just do it any track for us anytime you want. Nice. So, so this has been two years. I've driven, probably given almost a thousand ride arounds. I went 80, 180 miles an hour at Daytona, Talladega, mm -hmm. Texas, Vegas, um, Kentucky, Charlotte, uh, Fontana. So, yeah. So now I give rides to people. That's I remember great. my very first ride was, I was just so, wow, wow, this is so cool. How do you get the job like this? This is amazing. <laughs> um, and a lot of people ask me after the ride, God, you have the greatest job in the world. How did you get it? Mm -hmm. and I said, well, I've just driven a lot of laps. And I'm the only one actually who probably for the school isn't a professional race car driver, but they'd never let me do what I do unless I could walk the walk. So, right. Yeah. In fact, I'll be in Daytona soon giving rides. Yeah. Very cool. So and Daytona is a cool track because it's banked at 31 degrees in the corners mm -hmm. and it's a two and a half mile oval and we're getting around it in less than a minute. So wow. we're, we're booking and I take all kinds of people, some in their eighties, kids under 10 years old. Um, I always tell them to try to pick up their leg when they're in the corner and most of them can't because of the G forces. Right. Uh, they're surprised. And I, I say the first time I go through turn one or, or turn three full speed, most of them think they're going to die because you're used to getting off a highway ramp at 40, mm -hmm. 50 miles an hour. They think I'm going to slow down or hit the brakes straight in. But what keeps you on the track is the banking, the tires, and the downforce in the car. Mm -hmm. So It's an illusion to them, but it's very real to them too. They think, oh my God. Remember I had this one woman who was really like a hard ass and she was determined just not to show any emotion on the on the ride and when we finished she said you know going in on the second lap i made peace with god i was gonna die and i was happy about it <laughs> and i laughed and what are you usually hitting turns at about 180 miles an hour well to be honest probably i'm going into turn one at, at daytona around 170 and then you know you slow down a little bit in the corner not because i'm letting off the throttle but because of the friction from the corner, um, mm -hmm. the RPM slow down a little bit. I'm flat the whole time though. Actually, I'm not yeah. flat. I have to manage the rev limiter. There's a chip in there that only allows the engine to go to so many RPMs. Mm -hmm. So I get really close to that. If I hit it, the engine doo -doo 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 goes like that and the car slows a little. So I try to manage right under the chip. Yeah. And that's the biggest, you know, and I guess one thing I'll say about it is you know, with COVID and, and the political environment, everything, people say, you know, is it stressful? You, know, you go out there and you do this and maybe you give 40 rides a day. Is it stressful? You know, knowing that you've got somebody's life in your hands. And, you know, my answer really thought about it, it's when I'm going into turn one or turn three, I can't think about anything else besides that corner. Mm -hmm. I can't think about politics. I can't think about my personal life. I can't think about COVID and it's kind of relaxing, mm -hmm. you know, weird. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I can totally you know relate with that. Though. Has speed always been a common theme in your life? Yeah. I mean, again, with, with the MIG and the, the planes, yeah. certainly with rockets, with cars, um, bobsled. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think a lot of guys are into speed. Yeah. I don't know. Sure. Something, but I also know what can happen. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you watch the old indie qualifying and you just see these horrific accidents where people are just destroyed. I mean, bodies ripped apart, mm -hmm. fires. But the sport is so much safer now than it used to be. Yeah. Um, Sir Jackie Stewart, the Formula One legend, really was a pioneer in, in making the cockpit safer, the roll bars, the belts, the helmets, mm -hmm. the driving suits, the, the cells, the fuel cells, so they didn't explode, different types of gasoline, alcohol the safer barrier walls around the track, the runoff areas, all those things back when he drove, he drove from 68 to 73. And he told me, if you drove Formula One those five years consecutively, you had a two out of three chance of dying. Now these days, you know, rarely do you see it. 
fatality in, in yeah. Formula One or NASCAR or IndyCar. It happens. I mean, I was at a track at Pocono a few years ago where someone was killed uh, uh, in, in the race, uh, but, but it's, it's rare. And, and actually a lot of the people, you know, as, as things happen, for example, when Dale Earnhardt, you know, was killed mm -hmm. at Daytona, um, what happened was his neck snapped. And so now they have something called a Hans device, which hooks onto the helmet right, and it won't yeah. allow your neck to snap. Yeah. So every time there's a horrific accident, they find out something. You know, at Charlotte many years ago, there was a wreck and the wheel flew off the car over the fence and killed three people on the stands. Wow. Now they put tethers on the wheels so the wheels can't fly off. So wow, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, on the Indy cars anyway. Yeah. You don't usually see it with the NASCARs. Um, but, but again, see the accidents and look at the people walk away. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I always tell people, you know, you think I'm crazy, maybe driving 160, 170 out there. But I'm safer in that car on that track than you are at 100 miles an hour in your car. Sure. Because if something happens at 100 in your car, you're dead. Yeah. I got on I-95 on of the Merritt Parkway. <laughs> yeah. And look, I've been guilty of that stuff too. I don't have a car because I live in New York City. But but someday I want to get a, a used vet. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's the poor man's supercar. I, I'm a journalist. I can't afford a Ferrari or Lamborghini, but, but a vet, an old vet. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yep. The other thing is I've driven 13 different cars above 200 miles an hour. Wow. And if you think about that statistic, that's a scary statistic because most of those were passenger cars mm -hmm. on the Autobahn or Nardo test track in Southern Italy or on Volkswagen test track or even on the open road. I'll never drive another car above 200 miles an hour. I'm getting mm. wiser as I get older. Sure. What I found in, amazing is with all the death-defying things that you've done in your life, you sustained one of your greatest injuries while figure skating, correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a show at Forbes called The Adventurer, and mm -hmm. I used to bring on – athletes and you know i had buzz aldrin and, and um sean white and joe frazier you know just a number of uh, and and i once had sasha cohen on the, the olympic um, silver medalist in torino figure skater mm -hmm. and before the um we were talking and she goes you know I, I know you like to drive fast she goes i've always wanted to learn how to drive a lamborghini i said okay i'll tell you what you i'll teach you how to drive a lamborghini you teach me how to figure skate she said, deal. So I went out to California and she, she trained at a place called the Aliso Viejo Ice Palace. And I got Lamborghini to give me a car and we went out on a 405. I think it was a 405. One of those, those, those places out in LA. And it was pretty open and she had the car up to about 130. And that was supposed to be the dangerous part of the story. And so we had the video and everything of it. And the second part was to go figure skating and she would teach me how to figure skate and I'd never been on skates in my life which mm -hmm. was really stupid and um here I am with the Olympic uh, silver medalist and I want to do a spin and she's like you can't even stand up on your skates you want to do a spin I said yeah and the video camera for video guys were there and stuff and so she said okay get down in a crouch position swing your arm and like you're going to punch somebody and you'll just go around well, I swung my arm, and the next thing I knew, I was in an ambulance. I didn't remember anything. I had been, wow. I fell on my head on the ice, knocked myself, concussion level three, which is the worst you can get, um, knocked out for two minutes on the ice. Um, I, I saw the video of it later. Her coach, John Nix, Olympic coach, is there holding me, my head up, and, and they're asking me, where, where are you? And I, I thought about it. I don't know. What's your name? I don't know. Um, so they took me to the hospital and they kept me overnight. And I had to have about 12 or 13 stitches around my eye. But yeah, that was a serious injury. And again, who would have thought, right? Yeah. You know, and then Sasha and I became friends afterwards. So we made lemonade with lemons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but right. but it, um, she was pretty scared when it happened. And mm -hmm. rightly so. You, sure. know, you, you hear about concussions nowadays and I don't yeah. want to get any more of them. No. Yeah. So, but no. yeah, go figure, right? <laughs>
Oh, no, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> I've always uh, admired all the people that you have interviewed. I remember with Explorers Club, your legend series, Buzz Aldrin, Chuck Yeager, John Glenn. Mm-hmm. Was that like interviewing your heroes, basically? It was. For me, I, I tried to pick people who I had idealized as a kid. Of course, being a baby boomer, John Glenn, I remember the space race with the Soviets. And John, you know, I mean, Yuri Gagarin was the first to orbit the Earth. He was he was Russian and we had to catch up with him. And John Glenn, you mm-hmm. know, first American. And of course, the right stuff, the movie and everything. Chuck Yeager, same thing. First man to break the sound barrier. Um, these were all heroes. Uh, yeah. um, Buzz Aldrin, of course, uh, uh, part of Apollo 11, the second man to stand on the moon. So, yeah, I brought them all in um, to the Explorers Club. It was a rather difficult chore because the club doesn't have a lot of money to pay, A, pay anybody, B, mm-hmm. to pay their travel. So I had to kind of talk them into it when they were in New York right. to come club and do this and um i did about 45 of them Hmm. you know bertram picard uh scott carpenter jim whitaker first american to climb everest um franklin chang diaz astronaut four seven times to the space station scientist you know i mean john glenn buzz aldrin i mean there were tons of them the who's who of of exploration yeah so for me it was a charge Mm -hmm. at some point i would almost be you know, like Chris Farley, when he interviewed Paul McCartney, like, oh, oh, you're uh, Paul, Paul McCartney. Uh, you remember you were in that band called the Beatles? Yes, Chris, I remember. <laughs> so, oh so sometimes, yeah, I would feel like that. Um, but there's something, you know, as I as I've interviewed more and more people and, and believe me, I've interviewed Elon Musk. You you get better at it, mm-hmm. you know. I remember when I first, I've interviewed Buzz many times and I'm friends with Buzz, but I remember the very first time I interviewed him, I, I kind of made the mistake of saying, so what did you feel when you stood on the moon? And he looked at me with those steely eyes and he said, can you give me a multiple choice list of answers about how I should have felt? <laughs> as far as I was concerned, we were proceeding with the checklist. There's a lot to do on the checklist. We were not paid to feel. We were paid to do a job. And I was a little bit taken aback at the time, but now I think it was great because he told the truth. Yeah. You know, some people make up these stories about this and that. And, mm-hmm. and the other one that took me 12 years to interview was Neil Armstrong because I, I, I didn't realize when I first tried to interview him that he, doesn't, he just didn't do interviews. I had interviewed Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to climb Everest, and my thesis for the story was how has mountain climbing changed since 1953 when you and Tenzing Norgay climbed Everest? And I guess I did that interview in 1995. And of course, next year, the big into thin air thing happened, but, but Hillary kind of predicted it with all the people on the mountain. But he said, after the interview, he said, you know, you should, you should talk to my friend Neil Armstrong about how space travel has changed since he walked on the moon in 1969. I said, oh, that's a good idea. So yeah, sure. I got, this, uh, yeah, sure. So I got this post office box number. You have to send all requests for Armstrong interview and um, all excited. I sent him the Hillary story and, and Hillary had told me that they had flown to the North pole together. He and Neil Armstrong. And I thought, Oh, what did you say? Like we knocked the bastard off one small step for man. What, what did you guys say when you got out of the airplane? He said, we didn't say anything. <laughs> so I get this letter back two weeks later and it's, it's from Neil Armstrong and it's like typed like with an old typewriter and stuff. And, and he says something like, Jim, um, thank you for your interest in interviewing me. Clearly from what you sent me on Sir Edmund Hillary, you're an accomplished journalist. I respectfully will decline, but thank you for the offer. And he signed this, he signed the letter. So to That's this cool. day, I think that letter is worth a couple of grand. Yeah, I kept it. I would never sell it, but no, no. So that began a 12 year wooing process of getting mm-hmm. him to do an interview with him. Yeah, I mean, sure I remember I, first time I met him, well, I met him in Explorers Club dinner. I don't know if it was 2000, whenever he was the sort of the big speaker that night, it was in the ballroom at the Waldorf. And mm-hmm. um, there was a line of people in the green room beforehand to meet him. George Plimpton was in the line, Walter Cronkite was in the line. And I was in, I got in the line. 
so when I got up to the front and we had name tags on, he says, I said, hi, Neil, my name is Jim. He goes, I know who you are. And I said, well, why won't you do an interview? And he goes, you know, Jim, interviews are like first drafts. I'd rather have a fourth or fifth draft. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, good. So I went home that week and I sent a list of six questions and I gave him five blank pieces of paper. And I said, throw the first four drafts away and send me the fifth one. And he sent me an email saying, you're too much. And then we got, got to be friends. We got to be friends on email. And um, I helped him out with some, some things with Scott Pelley in 60 minutes, some inaccuracies and whatnot. But finally, he actually, there was one thing. We, we did a story at Forbes about the American dream. What does the American me dream mean today? And this was in probably 2005 or 2006. And of course he declined, but he said off the record, the American dream today is nothing more than sitting back and being entertained. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow. And he's right. I mean, it's gotten worse. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, finally, you know, Angela Schuster, uh, the editor of the Explorers Journal, she said, why don't you interview him for your back page? And I'm like, yeah, right. So again, I send him a note and he sends me back a note. This is on email. And he says, I have no interest in being interviewed, nor do I have a reason. But if you send me four questions, I'll do my best to answer them. <laughs> that was nice. I couldn't believe it. So immediately I sent him four questions thinking it's a joke or something. Mm -hmm. And he's very carefully worded the answers and sent them back. And I got my interview with Neil Armstrong. Wow. That was great. But I think, you know, the point is you just have to be persistent. And yeah. I think I earned his trust. Exactly. I saw him a couple times at different events. One of at the Explorers Club right before he died. I don't know why, but I hugged him and I, I said something like, you know, I, I'm, I can't help it. You, you know, what you've done to inspire mankind. And he kind of laughed. And that was the last time four months later he died. So, yeah. but that was yeah. a great at the club. Yeah. Just out of those guys right there between Armstrong and Aldrin, Jagger and Glenn, I mean, you can't even just gauge their contributions they've given to the world and to aerospace. It's just so dangerous. yeah, and yeah, and again, it wasn't just them though. I mean, Bertram Picard, the first man to go around the world in a balloon. Yeah, you know, aviators. Jim, Jim Whitaker. I mean, I've interviewed Reinhold Messner, first man to climb all 14 8,000 meter peaks without oxygen. Hillary, the first man to climb Everest. Uh, I'm pretty good friends with his uh, Tenzing Norgay's son, Norbu, and Jamling. Mm -hmm. So I've been lucky. But again, I've pursued these people. They don't mm -hmm. come to me. Out of all these guys, do you see a common thread amongst them all that made them who they are? Yeah, there's some common threads. I mean, I remember I asked both. I did James Cameron once at the club as a legend. He's the guy who directed Titanic and had yeah. gone down to the bottom of the ocean also in the submersible to the Mariana Trench. And I asked John Glenn the same question, which was, what does exploration mean to you? And both of them came back with the exact same answer, which was curiosity in action. Yeah. And I thought, that's a great, you know, I think most of the people are fairly creative in their vision for the future. Mm -hmm. They're confident, they're cautious, they're, believe it or not, they're, they're not wacko, thrill seekers Other, right. i did interview the guy who went over the falls twice in a barrel and survived he's a little crazy but <laughs> um but yeah yeah um thoughtful um understood what their contribution meant to the world mm -hmm. were willing to take that risk to do it but but by no means were they daredevils um yeah they're very calculated risk takers exactly calculated risk and the reason I think they survive is because they, they, they do that. And people ask me how I'm still alive. And I don't know. I mean, I think I'm <laughs> a fairly calculated risk taker. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is people say, well, do you get scared? And, and I ask that question actually to everyone I interview, what, what are you afraid of and, and how mm -hmm. do you handle fear? And mm -hmm. Everybody has sort of a different answer, but, but the real answer is the, the common thread is that, you cannot let it take over your emotional um, situation because if you do and you get really afraid, you become in, in a, unable to, to perform. 
And yeah. I know that when I was in that yeah. Indy car at Texas and I fixated for a split second too long on the speedometer, it said 200. I'm like, wow, I'm going 200 miles an hour in an Indy car. That was my dream as a kid. And then I looked up and the wall was coming right at me. Um, <laughs> and I just flicked my wrist a little bit to the left without panicking and I missed the wall by an inch. But uh, mm -hmm. had I not looked up that split second, I would have probably been killed. Mm -hmm. So part of it is you just have to perform under pressure. The way I deal with fear is, I, that's not me getting into the race car, the submersible or the, you know, the bobsled, that, that's an actor. Mm -hmm. That's some guy who has to do a story. He has to get the facts. I think it's almost like an actor mm -hmm. who's maybe shy and, and, and goes out on the stage as a different person. Yeah. And that allows me sort of the confidence to do it because I have to do it. Yeah. What if one of them said, one of the pilots said something like, they're more afraid of screwing up. Don't let me screw the pooch. Is there <laughs> fear not dying in a rock? accident or something and mm -hmm. you know you think about that sometimes in your own life you're you, you don't want to embarrass yourself or whatever yeah. and uh so that keeps you from thinking too much about it mm -hmm. and i think if you think too much um you can also get scared but yeah. you can't be cavalier no i remember uh interviewed dan weldon two-time indy 500 champ in 2011 he just won the Indy 500 and they bring, they used to bring the, the guys to New York to do the interview. He had, his wife had just given birth, um, Susie to, to a baby. And I asked him, I said, well, do you drive any differently now that you're a new father? And he was kind of flip. And he said, well, I can't drive differently because then I become a danger to myself and the people around me. You know, Jim, when your number's up, it's up. Yeah. And he was killed four months later at Vegas. Ooh. So, yeah, big car, any car pilot. And I'm, I'm sure the other thing is they think it never, it's never going to happen to them. It's going to happen mm -hmm. to somebody else. So, yeah, I mean, I think most of the people are able to take fear and, and they're able to mold it into something positive, positive energy. But if you don't have fear, you're just dumb. Yeah. And I think it, it's like anything else of taking the negatives uh, or taking positives from negatives is that the fear is either going to freeze you up or you can utilize it to sharpen you. Yeah. And if you don't utilize it to sharpen, I mean, I remember Aldrin said fear clouds the mind. He was in a Korean what fighter pilot in, in, in the war. And, you know, he said, you really have to, your, your reactions are so quick that if you let fear cloud your mind, I also remember, so recently I interviewed William Shatner, who, wow, um, yeah. you know, Star Trek and all Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah, he's, he's cool. Yeah, he's a character. I mean, he, he does <laughs> everything, you know. Yeah. But I was interviewing him because he had a blues album out of all things. He was singing the blues. And he did um, three Cream songs, Sunshine of Your Love, Crossroads. And so I listened to the stuff and it was, it's like him talking it's you you know you know sunshine your love jack bruce singing it mm -hmm. eric clapton singing it but he's like it's getting near dawn when lights close the tired eyes you know you're just like he did that at for first rocket think, man years ago i think yeah yeah and yeah. you don't think it's working but if you listen to it a couple times and you free your mind up from what you're used to here and it, it kind of yeah. works because he's a theatrical anyway my point with him was he had been in a couple Twilight Zone episodes way back when. You're probably too young to remember that show, but Rod mm -hmm. Serling, The Twilight Zone. And um, one of them were, was uh, him and his wife, a newlywed, had, had just driven into a city and they had a problem with their car. Mm -hmm. And they had to bring it into a shop. And so they went into this coffee shop to wait and have lunch. And there was this machine, of, uh, like a devil head machine that you could put a quarter in or nickel back then and it would tell like give you answers to questions and at first you know the answers were pretty innocuous and he said something oh well i get promoted at work and it said you already have been he's like, oh yeah right so his wife says call call your work oh yeah you were just promoted wow. so anyway it goes on and on and they start to believe at least he starts to believe what's going on and it it's 
it gets him to the point where like, it'll say, well, we ever get out of this town. It will say, you will never know. And it got more and more insidious. And, mm -hmm. and I said, in the end, you know, she just said, we're driving out of town and they did. But I asked William Shatner, he said, well, that was the fear. If you're told too many different things, you don't know what decision to make, you freeze. And that's mm -hmm. what happened to the character in the Twilight Zone. So again, I think with fear, you've got to be able to break things out and say, what does right. this mean? What does it mean? You know, I've talked to a lot of mountaineers. I recently interviewed um, uh, Nirmal Purja, who just did the first winter ascent of K2. And he'd also climbed all 14, 8,000 meter peaks in less than wow. six months, which is nuts. Ooh, that's super um, nuts. Yeah. And, uh, but I asked him about fear and he goes, you know, he said, sometimes it's in the gut. You know, you, it's a life or death decision, go or no go, the weather, this and that. And you, you, can't, you can't say yes because of honor or pride. Mm -hmm. You have to be realistic with yourself and honest. Yeah. And some days you have it, some days you don't. Some days the weather's bad, some days it isn't. And he has a gut feel. And so far, mm -hmm. it's kept him alive. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think a gut thinking. feel is important. To switch gears a little bit, no pun intended, you have a fantastic hobby. I'm a guitar fanatic, been a lead guitarist for 20 years, and You've interviewed some of the greatest yeah, rock and roll yeah. icons known to man. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, again, it's it's like the the, the exploring uh, uh, people, the legends, the um, athletes I've interviewed. It, it's it's people that I admire. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of classic rock music, um, the '60s, even the late '50s. Uh, it's my generation. Getting into the '70s, I start disco. Not into that, but yeah. So I thought, why not try to get some of these guys for interviews? Yeah, I didn't know if I could get them or not, but mm. Forbes, the name that you never know, right? Yeah. And so I started interviewing these people, Grace Slick from the Jefferson Airplane, Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, and it just started to grow. You know, mm -hmm. Roger Daltrey from The Who, you know, um, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker from Cream. I couldn't believe these people I was getting and the interesting things they would tell me about Woodstock, Altamont, you know, the British invasion. So I've done 25 of these now. Mickey Dolan's I just did from the monkeys and I'm putting it all together in a book called Amplified uh, about mm -hmm. 60s rock. It's a historical book really. And I think those stories need to get out. Some of them have already died since I've interviewed them like Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker are no longer. Yeah, there. Ginger died. That yeah. must have been a trip. What was Ginger Baker like? <laughs> He's a character. I, the absolute best drummer, I think, on the face of the planet. Uh, I, I think, agree. You know, John Bonham and all those guys bow to him. Uh, but, man, he, he was a strange one. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you about the interview in a second. But the thing that, if you ever saw the rock and roll induction of Cream into the Hall of Fame, rock and no. roll, well, ZZ Top does the induction and mm -hmm. so the drummer gets up from zz top and he says i'm not here tonight because this is the place to be and i'm not here tonight because i want to get out of the studio because there's nothing more i hate than recording in the studio i'm here tonight to hear ginger baker play wow. i spent hundreds and hundreds of hours trying to copy his stuff and i couldn't he inspired a whole generation of drummers so when i'm done up here I'm going to go hide behind one of the amps and I'm going to watch him. And he better do what he did on the records because <laughs> if he doesn't, I'm going to be disappointed. And, and I thought, wow, you know, here's a real drummer. I mean, he's a good drummer from ZZ yeah. Top. He was inspired so much by Ginger. Ginger was the first to really bring the double bass drum set out. Yeah. Uh, he was a jazz drummer. So yeah, he, was so he had a huge jazz yeah. influence. Yeah, and, and, and he was able to mold rock and jazz and classical and put it all together. And I don't know how the guy was wired, but he could do like 13 different times in his head at the same time, and they all were on. But, yeah, you know, Toad, yeah. you know, drum solos like Toad. So I, I spent a, a whole day with him out at his uh, horse ranch in Colorado at the time, Parker, Colorado. And he was on very good behavior that day because oh, his you. wife of 30 years younger um, kept him under tow because it was Forbes magazine and they wanted mm -hmm. a good story. Yeah. So, but he, at some points, he really had no filter. I remember asking him about Kiss. I said, you know, what do you think of these bands like Kiss who reunite and make all this money? 
And he goes, they credited us with the birth of that sort of thing. Well, if that's the case, there should be an immediate abortion. <laughs> I hate those bandex trousers and whatever. Um, and, and that got a lot of play on the internet. People were picking that up who were Kiss fans. And, yeah. and then he said, he talked about John Bonham from Zeppelin. And he goes, John's not half the drummer I was. And blah, blah. I'm like, wow. John Bonham's yeah. pretty good. But, you yeah. Know, uh, and so that, a lot of consternation about that quote. But overall, he was a smart guy. He had been a heroin addict for I don't know how long. He'd been on and off heroin. Um, mm. but, uh, but he had some funny, funny quotes. Uh, he, he really ragged on Americans and how to make tea. We don't know how to make tea. It's Nat's piss, he called it. And, um, and, and he talked about how you need to have the boiling water and pour it over the tea leaves and, and all this stuff. And, uh, and at one point he teared up. Um, I thought he was going to cry because I asked him what he wanted his legacy to be. And, and he, I guess a friend of his, a drummer, had just died. Mm -hmm. A good jazz drummer. I can't remember the guy's name. But he started like thinking and then he's started to tear up a little bit. I'm thinking, oh God, I don't want Ginger Baker to cry when I'm interviewing. This is a Barbara <laughs> Walton. <Walsh."> you know? <laughs> and you're lucky he's dead because he's, he's alive and you told everybody that he almost cried. He'd hit you with his cane. Well, that's what he did to uh, beware Mr. Baker, right? Yeah, broke his nose, right? Broke the guy's nose, right? Uh, I got to see that. I've never seen that. He put you in hospital. What? Oh my God. Yes. That, it's very people, good. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, but he was smart and and he was sort of a sensitive guy. Um, mm -hmm. Underneath the bravado, you know. Yeah. He, Jack Bruce was a very different kind of um, um, uh, character. He was very sort of um, charismatic and mm -hmm. all that, but he also had a a hair trigger temper where he could just uh, go off. When that was Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey is a really nice guy. Uh, I love his short. acting too. He's quite yeah. an actor. Well, I'll tell you. Well, I can't tell you because it's 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 a private story. But just suffice to say, I did something for him once. Mm -hmm. He never forgot it. And mm -hmm. so, anytime I'm, you know, they're at Madison Square Garden or something, he he will give me backstage passes. Oh wow, that's that's that incredible. Um, he works a lot with Teen Cancer America. And that's, mm -hmm. I helped him out with that organization. And he wrote a cover quote for my book. Beautiful. And uh, I, I don't remember the, all I know is that, you know, backstage, maybe a year and a half ago, they were playing at Madison Square Garden. And, you know, I wanted to ask him for a cover quote, but I didn't know how to do it. So mm -hmm. I, um, I wrote something up because a lot of cover quotes, you know, and I said, gave it to him. I said, would you write a cover quote? And he said, sure. I said, how's this? And he goes, you know, I want to write a real cover quote, Jim. Send me six chapters of the book. I'll read it and I'll write your quote. And I'm thinking, right, that's never going to happen. So six weeks later, I get this quote back that he had clearly read the material. And I don't remember the exact quote. It was complimentary. But the last line was, jumping Jim Clash is a gas, gas, gas. And I <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So, uh, but yeah, Roger Daltrey's, uh, Pete Townsend's a little more prickly. Yeah. Than Pete. Um, you know, and I've interviewed, some of them have been jerks. I mean, well, not really jerks, but I, I once interviewed Tommy um, Two-Tone, who did the song Jenny Jenny, H675309. And yeah. he got on the phone and he was drunk out of his mind. And I thought, boy, I got to get something out of him. So yeah. I said, I said something like, well, why do you think your song Jenny Jenny was so much of a hit in the United States. And he goes, oh man, can't you think of a better question to ask me than that? <laughs> <laughs> so I said something like, uh, in my mind, I thought I got nothing to lose. So I said, okay, Tommy, what are you up to now? Not that mm -hmm. anybody cares. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes, touche or something. And <laughs> we talked for like 45 minutes. Um, uh, and he gave me a funny story. He said when when they originally put that song out, everybody was calling that number and getting mad. People get angry with different area codes and stuff that had the number. Mm -hmm. so he said well, he did an interview in 1981 with People Magazine. And the People uh, 
journalist put his phone number in the story. Tommy Tuttle. <laughs> so everyone was calling him. <laughs> he had to change his number. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, the things that, um, the things they say about Altamont, you know, I've, I'm pretty good friends with Yorma McAlpin and Jack Cassidy from the airplane. They're in hot tuna now. And actually one night I had them at the club, Explorers Club. Oh yeah. yeah I did Exploring Legends live with the two of them. And it was, a, it was sort of the adventures of music in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Who else did I? Uh, God, it was someone else. Oh, Mario Andretti. I had Mario Andretti. Oh, wow. That must have been nice. And what a great guy. And, you know, Mario's such a nice guy. He, he'll sign anything for anybody. He, mm -hmm. he um, never, he'll always take a picture with you. Even at the club that night, there were people waiting outside who couldn't get tickets to have him sign like little toy cars and stuff. Yeah. And did it. But I remember one of the funniest stories he told was, so in, in, after he won the Indy 500 in 1969, he was a pretty famous guy. And he was riding with his friend uh, and his friend was speeding and they got pulled over and the cop was angry because I think they were going like 30 miles an hour above the speed limit. So the cop comes over to the driver's side and says to the driver, who do you think you are, Mario Andretti? And the guy goes, and there's Mario sitting there. Um, they didn't get a ticket. So when can we expect the, uh, the Amplified book to come out? Well, it's been delayed because of COVID. So mm -hmm. I think this year sometime. And the good news about it is I've been able to compile newer interviews during the, the delay, like Mickey Dolan's from the Monkees. Mm -hmm. He was somebody who originally wasn't in the book. What's his name? Dion from Dion and the Belmonts. You know, run around mm -hmm. Sue and the Wanderer. Oh, yeah. Bronx kid. Um, got him in the book. Uh, so, yeah, um, but I would say I want it to come out earlier because I don't want all these guys to be dead by the time it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, mean, right. I mean, Butch Trucks from the Norman Brothers, he's gone. He shot himself, killed himself um, after I interviewed him. I don't think I did it to him, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, four, four months oh, after that. Ian yeah. Anderson, what, what was he like? I When I heard Aqualung for the first time, it just blew my mind that guitar riff and, and everything. And he was such a unique individual. Well, Ian Anderson's never been um, happy with the way that Aqualung album came out. Really? And they played it in a big church and there was a lot of reverb. And he's to this day, he still doesn't feel. And I've interviewed Martin Barr and um, Clive Bunker, you know, the drummer and the lead guitarist of Jethro Tull, who were in that recording. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't have a problem with it, but Ian had a problem with the sound of it. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Anderson is a very bright guy and, and quite tame, uh, much tamer than his image. Like when I, yeah. he's, bald, he's bald now. And, um, but, but I was talking to him about the, the early days and he says, well, you know, all those other bands, that, members, they'd go out and drink and take drugs. And I'd go home and watch Johnny Carson to my hotel, you know? Um, I totally wouldn't think that about him. Yeah. I thought he'd be right there partying. No, no, not at all. Wow. Yeah. And of course, the age old question, um, you know, how do you feel about not being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. That yeah. Band, Kiss in there. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Jethro Tull's not in there. Uh, and some of these rappers. But, you know, he said, look, he said, it's, it's an American institution. Uh, it's a club. And they're going to pick whoever they want to be in it. And there are a lot yeah. of other owners like Mose Allison and other people that should be in there before we are. So mm, yeah. he was very... But he said one time he did go, I guess there's a museum at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And they had like him in there. And he goes, gosh, I was so small and the clothes were so tight. He said, I don't think I could wear those clothes anymore. <laughs> so he has a good sense of humor about it. Oh, that's good. But he's a serious musician. And uh, the most recent show I saw of him was all the members were, not none of them were original members. And then he had a stand-in when, when some of the, really high parts he couldn't sing anymore um, mm -hmm. but but he still has that voice and that flute playing ability oh incredible flute playing i mean i did him as part of i did actually did him as part of space stories for the explorers club a few years ago he had done a flute duet with katie coleman an, an astronaut 
And mm-hmm. she took his flute up to the International Space Station. And really? They, they played beret together. He was on the ground and she was in the space station on Yuri Gargarin's that is so cool. anniversary or something of the space. Yeah. And so we got that as part. I interviewed Katie and uh, Ian um, uh, on um, te- whatever, Zoom or whatever, whatever they called it back then. Yeah. And uh, it was very entertaining for the club people. You know, sure. a lot of people were in the interview fan. So it sounds oh, like you were cool. kind of. I like to talk about this stuff because for me, it's inspirational, you know? Mm-hmm. Jim, thank you so much for coming on, man. This has been cool. fantastic. I've always known yeah. through the years, this long list of incredible things you've done. It's been so fantastic to talk to you. Definitely, well, let's keep you. in touch. Well, thank you. I've only scratched the surface. We could I talk know. about a lot more, but that might scare me more. So let's just stay away from it. <laughs> <laughs> and then definitely, yes, let's talk again and when you return from Chernobyl. Okay. All right, Rusty. Thank Perfect. you very much okay. for the interview. Have a great Bye-bye. evening, pal. Bye-bye. <laughs>